This is a documentary of fine arts at the University of California in Santa Cruz and of the artists who work within this university system. to write a review of her sculpture show. She made these sculptural weavings. And I said, but I don't know anything about sculpture, because I've never sculpted myself, except, you know, I've made sandwiches. That's about as far as it goes. And, you know, what am I going to write? And she said, well, just write your reactions to it. But I just sort of tried to approach it as best I could, coming from a point where I didn't have any frame of reference just take it on its own level and things doing things like that sort of helped me develop a sense of what my own aesthetics are the way i work it the world itself has a sort of finality to it even in its fluidity it, it, it there's something very solid to it even it, as it shifts there's something very solid to it um even better the negatives that I shoot are, are even more solid. I mean, they're real. They're the only definition of real I can have. And because of that, I can only put them the way they are. You know, that's, that's what the world did here and now. I want to say that I see these individual photographs as sort of fragments. A photograph, in a way, negates the original. Whatever was is no longer there. You've translated it to something new, and, and the old being falls away. At no time could you really grasp everything that was going on. Whether these isolated events could be viewed as performances within themselves. Is it a performance to watch someone roll down uh, a series of steps? Within the larger context of the entire piece, it was all connected, but the fact that you couldn't see everything and that you could hear that things were going on somewhere else was real disturbing. sounds that I hear. I then take those sounds, or the memory of those sounds, to be more specific, and try to figure out a way of realizing them. Electron music has the advantage of being unfamiliar. It also has the advantage of being, with proper equipment, totally controllable. You can create any kind of sound that you can think of. I think of dance in terms of film sometimes, where you know, I think about Okay, and this sort of dissolves, and this comes up, and yeah. you have to sit here yeah. and have all this. I remember sitting when I was sitting up on the, the three of us, Gene and Katie, and I was sitting up on the ledge and leaning, and I would see it was like all different perspective things happening, like and I, it was like God, if you could just if you could film it that way, where you would flash on this, and then all of a sudden you'd see this going on, mm -hmm. and layer it, it would be really incredibly rich. I do see TV as part of the world, okay, and I see it in a double way. I'm not only taking photographs of part of the world, that is a television image, but also something that's being portrayed there, which is also part of the world. Okay, it's an image of an image. Okay, you can keep doing it forever. Eventually you get white noise. 
And so I said, don't try to the TV viewer pays in and out of the running the television evolution program of the media. in the rhythm of Big the Big sharks frequency. preying on live time, in buying satellites, space 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 and buying Hollywood, taking the free TV, making pay TV with better reception. The viewer meets herself on the center of the movies in the back of the basement television pictures. However, our time is going to be on their back. We'll make TV as a product as opposed to a hobby. In Only if they rhythm, let us. He himself, they could completely monopolize the production of video discs. Who cares? Our program, NBC, NBC, CBS, ABC, or HBO, who wins? External direction and internal direction dominate by turn. That's the way the net works. The consciousness of the viewer changes. The feeling that, that everything unfolds in front of you. And you as a viewer, in a sense, are forced to explore. Like dreams I've had lately, I can't really imagine them happening in paintings because what, what I've been doing is um, dreaming a painting and then walking inside the painting and exploring all the objects inside of it. So, well, it might just be like a need to understand form. I walked in, into one painting, and then it's an environment, and then I walk into another painting, or I see other paintings inside of the painting, you know? It's just really strange. I don't, um, haven't put it all together. <laughs> Virginia Woolf said back in 1925, this is an age of fragments. And that's, that's what sort of all this is. It's fragments being pieced together like a jigsaw puzzle. There are five bodies occupying three or four adjacent steps on the left side of the stairs, more or less close to the handrail, which moves along. It also, sharing the same movement, now made even less perceptible, even more doubtful. By the, form the graphic art was pretty much discouraged in, in design, with playing with the surface, elements. With two straight edges on which no identifiable mark allows its speed to be determined. This is an so idea I play with. Um, um, I play with the idea of facts in the world. Um, the um, personally, I believe that facts are shifting. shifting. They're modulating, sort of like the music that was going on here. It's modulating. It keeps changing. It doesn't make any less true or more true. But for me, what photography is, is catching those changes at the point where they change off. with another student and they did a piece called Pulse. It took several weeks to do the piece and it occurred at different places throughout the Santa Cruz campus. At different times of the day they had calculated it all out, yeah. some kind of uh, mathematical thing. To where the, the time was getting closer but the space was getting farther and farther apart. It was a very impressionistic approach in terms of in terms of just the environment of I mean, say, the architecture and then also the social environment. Basically, we, we observed patterns that people were already making, abstracting a lot of that into the piece in terms of uh, what happens to your body when you move from point A to point B. I had a great deal of difficulty when I started to first work on the ladder. I had no strength. As a matter of fact, I didn't even have any calluses on the hands. So if we worked two days in a row, we couldn't work a third day because the pads of the hands would be all red and swollen. And it really, I guess it took about four weeks to build up enough callus to say nothing about the strength and the daring to climb all the way up on that ladder. If you have control over them, you have this all set out so that there's only one way for them to move each time. Each time you, you give them the stimulus, there's only one possible response for them. Whereas if you have something that's more generalized, you give them a, a stimulus, there's a whole range of possible responses that they can make depending on each individual person, and there, there are many more possibilities for a, a group of people and, and creating an environment. 
I think art a lot reflects the environment of the artist. Just because I've lived here for four years, you know, something in the environment must have influenced me enough to put together a film that is probably not going to be so much a commercial kind of film, but more of a, a psychological study of some sort, of some inner feelings that I want to externalize. I think here at film, especially the good ones, relate a lot more to inner states of mind. They're like very meditative and sort of trying to work out problems. Most of us crave experience. We drift past shelves, reaching for a sweet potion guaranteed to revive the memory and satisfy the mind. When the mind is left to deal with itself and no longer has to come with two terms with objects, it is in a sense reduced to imitating itself as objects. I spent most of the night looking for and then I found out about Harvey. The next morning I learned that she had spent only five minutes or so also, and had gone back to the party and spent everything I wanted to tell her there. Also, I forgot everything I had wanted to tell her. A lot of my inspirations come to me during um, periods of meditation, and in these states I hear sounds. I hear things which I don't normally hear. Those sounds remain in my memory after I come back out of my meditation. And they usually are germs or ideas which I then evolve into pieces. You want to see an idea that you have crystallized and just be made accessible to other people. We try to, um, to put people in into um, situations initially that um, that we, we we wouldn't predetermine what their attitude would be, but putting someone up on a wall that's ten feet high or ten feet high and asking, <laughs> and then you know playing around with locomoting from one end to the other, a lot of times brings up a lot of <laughs> attitudes that and, and feelings about doing that that. We don't even need to predetermine. I want to make the audience think something, but not any specific. I want to be act as sort of a guide or a catalyst to their own thoughts and their own feelings. Basically, my feelings about the performance itself were that I was very glad that on Sunday night that it was together as it was. I felt like it was really the timing and the rhythm and everything of the piece was really excellent. We hadn't been together before the performance, you know. Usually you like to warm up with everybody and then there's sort of a group feeling that's been generated. Where we come from, as, it, as dancers is not from our feelings but from structure whereas you know actors they come through the feelings and they put this you know and then they impose the structure both art forms need all of that it's just the approach of, of very different dancers even even here are more concerned with keeping things relatively safe it wasn't so structured and it made it involved me to think instead of say, do this for eight counts. People generally tend to think that uh, music is something one listens to for enjoyment and entertainment, and that's it. And so that's just the beginning for me. Yeah. I like to keep people interested, but I like to make them think.
people are exposed constantly to other forms of music and they're, they're made to think, they're made to question. Maybe Beethoven wasn't the last great composer. Maybe Brahms wasn't even the last great composer. Maybe John Cage does have something to offer to them. You know, and if you're at a school where there's no contemporary music being performed or no new music being composed, then the performers have no access to it and they have no experience of it and that creates to a large extent a hostility on the part of a lot of traditionally trained um, musicians towards contemporary music. They don't understand it because they haven't ever been in involved in the process. They incorporate different media and they make it a very shared experience with the audience. Things that make the audience feel like part of the performance and the performers part of the audience. James. <laughs> Johnson. Are we so separated from them? We really were very separate and it was very difficult. I mean, towards Friday we started interacting with the audience a lot more. Verbally, you know, getting people to be involved but to um, structure it so that you are working with the audience all the time. Work however you want to work with it. I just want to see it. I just want to see it work. All right. Let's just see, it, and then we can move it around. The other thing is then is when Tim comes down, I want to avoid us all just kind of being dead. I either want us violently reacting, or I want us making a statement that we're out cold. When people worked in pairs or in, in groups or together, it seems like it was a lot easier to almost let things go. I mean, just because. So much would come out. I mean, you threw two people down there together and just they do incredible things. And it was real. And we also discovered that that was just a lot more difficult to direct. All right, now let me see what that silliness looks like. Basically, though, I want to see you as droves. Don't break your swarm. I surrounded by swarms of servants. So elegant and attentive. I think that's why more collaboration doesn't go on, because there isn't a real intermediate program here. The emphasis still seems to be on specialization. Either you just have to know a bunch of people who are into collaborating, or you have to really just want to collaborate like crazy, you know, and then find those people. But I find like most people don't realize that that's something they can do. What shall we do to Well, I don't, I, I don't know. When there's something that I want to try in a rehearsal, I have to go ahead and try it. If there's something that I want to see and the dancers don't like it, I just have to go for it. That happens a lot. It's a very easy trap to fall into as a composer to tell other people what to do. That's the nature of composition. I like to work with the people that I'm composing for. I like to interact with them, find out what they think, what they can do and then sort of sculpture the piece specifically for them. It creates a bond between performer and composer. When I listen to the music, it's, it's impossible to extract it from the dance. When he dances the dance, it's impossible to extract the process from the dance. It was more than just a dance. It was more than just music for a dance. It was a, um, an interaction between two people both of whom were interested in expressing themselves and in allowing the other person to express themselves and in expressing their duality and not being afraid to let each individual's work come through as that individual's work in collaboration with it. And I love collaborating. I think it's a really great way of working because, well, just in the performances I've been in, I've had the chance to act. It's something I never even considered doing before. What we've done isn't traditional acting or anything. It's more tr trying to coordinate things. Well, that's what intermedia is. The interaction between music and drama and dance and visual arts is quite remarkable here. There's another great advantage to this place, to use the FC over a lot of other schools, one of which is that the, the performing and visual arts share physical space.
At UCSC, we offer a, a theater major with emphasis in film or in dance or in theater, for example. At College 5, film can be studied as part of the ASM major, the aesthetic studies major. Uh, uh, that may seem like an artificial kind of categorization, but what that structure implies, in a sense, is the fact that film at UCSC is integrated into other broader categories. It does profit from an association with other disciplines and with other ways of studying the arts. What the department is trying to do is to give a holistic approach to, to theater. Really, the theory behind the theater arts department with an emphasis in dance or film or drama is to break down the boundaries that our culture has put up between the different forms or seeing them as separate art forms. On top is the old man's eye which scans the horizon and with sweeping motions brings to itself the movements of the water, the play of the seaweed. Over its knotty back, the eye feels the slipstream of dolphins. I thought that the interaction has been really an enlightening experience for me. It made me aware of a form of theater and a form of performance attitudes that is totally missing in, in music. The recital consciousness of most music schools is totally contradictory to the, the nature of what the real world expects from a performer, especially a performer involved in electronic music or media of any sort. And the attitude of dancers and theater people is, is a much more open, much more realistic attitude towards what you really have to do. The technology is involved. Who's going to set the lights? Who's going to take down the lights? And everybody helps. Everybody gets involved. And that sort of different perspective has helped me a lot in my own performance techniques. Um, we've got to do this last scene. The sound still haven't come through with sound. We've got to get the last scene right. How do you evaluate what worked and what didn't? <laughs> worked, in quotes, because we're still trying to figure out what that is. What do you mean it worked? Let's see, I mean, what works and what doesn't? The rest of you go and change. Does a light turn on? Okay, we're gonna put the tape in later, okay? We'll just go on. Can somebody turn the lights out, please? 56? This piece is rapidly falling apart. I don't know what's going on. Being a student at UCSC is sort of a paradox. The academic requirements for fulfilling a music major here are quite strenuous, so that the demands on my time are such that it hinders my creative energies. It keeps me from doing all the things that I want to do. But at the same time, being in an environment where there's a lot of artists and other creative people stimulates my creative energies and inspires me to do things that I probably wouldn't do in another environment. The time is 12 and 40 seconds. But the university, at the same time, is like it's a space in your mind yeah. that allows you the time to produce that sort of thing. Right. Yeah, it allows you the time. It, it defines time to produce those. In fact, I'm not sure it really allows you as much time as if you didn't go to the university. have more time if you didn't go to the university. But it does make some definitions for time and application. Yeah. And you take a course, you have to do some work. Should you have to have studio time to paint? Every student's supposed to, to put 15 hours of work into their class other than the class time. So the class time should be for learning and, and sharing all those ideas, that special kind of experience that you can't have sitting alone in your room.
Built a cave in the cliffs and rocks of those mountains where the sun almost never shines. Protected by such a dense array of cliffs and obelisks. Edicts were imposed forbidding anyone to trespass near the spot. And there Segismundo lives now, poor and wretched in his captivity. Why should I, whose soul is greater than a bird's, enjoy less liberty? Not anybody can make a film. Not anybody can write a poem. Uh, not anybody can do art. There's a thing called learning one's craft. And around here, that's just not taught. People don't learn the craft. Learn every possibility in your media. And love the tools of your trade. And don't try to be an artist until you know all that. Everything I want to say must come up and crash against the back of my shut teeth. I must bow and scrape, drink and smoke, sell and kiss different lovers' honest lips, make them photographs of you. Thrown aside, like glitter from a car, I've only haunted thoughts for both of you. You can't be taught how to be creative. You can be allowed to express your creativity but you cannot taught to be creative. You can be showed the tools for your art, whether it's painting or dancing or music. You can be showed the forms that other people have used. You can be made aware of the history, but you can't be taught creativity. It's something which has to be allowed to grow on its own. And this is the type of environment that not only lets you grow by yourself, but encourages you to be innovative, encourages you to do whatever art form it is that you're interested in. interested in doing other things, other aspects of, of dance, studying it as, as anthropology or studying it as dance therapy, you're left pretty much on your own. People that aren't um, in the larger flow of students, you have to be really self-motivated. know what you want. Like you had to want to to know about it in order, to, in order to find out. People wouldn't tell you. And like I always thought it'd be good if I had a class in like stretching, stretching canvases, mixing paints, grinding paints and inks and making paper and the school should provide I think that kind of information. And I would say it was more ideological than, than practical. We use what we have. Cave paintings were no less beautiful because oils were not yet invented. And they would be no less beautiful today, even with the invention of oils. What we call primitive work doesn't suffer from the lack of technology. Technology is, is very fragile. What is this piece anyway? It's almost like humans. I mean, you can never count on an instrumentalist to play the piece perfectly. They may have played it perfectly a hundred times, but that one time when they get on stage, they goof it up. It happens a lot with technology, too. Something's not working right. Sometimes the tape recorder just won't work when you need it. What can you do? You have to ad-lib, you have to go around it. In those situations, an understanding of the technology, I think, is very important. You have to understand where the technology has come from just as much as where the music has come from, because they're interacting. Whose idea is this, anyway? I never see computer music or electronic music as replacing acoustic music. I'd say most of my music is, in, is involved with interactions of acoustic and electronic music. Computers, synthesizers, tape recorders are expanding the field of music. They aren't changing the direction. They're helping, they're propelling it forward, but it's, it's not a question of one outdoing another. No matter how technically advanced computer music or electronic music ever gets, it will never replace the human element in music.
It's like human nature to be creative. Artists are always reminding people of a part of themselves that maybe they want to forget. Nothing matters anymore. Not, not this house, not that the walls were crumbling, not even my own daughter. I just didn't care anymore. Hello, so I got it. And you, Pia. Hello. Pia. Pia. Pia, I'm speaking to you. I'll put it into it. Something in the pocket, Sylvia. I'll put it into it. Thought it out every detail. I'll follow him in here. I'll have him bend over where father's clothes are, and then from behind, close up, I'll shoot him right in the back of his head. Sylvia? Individual choices ought to be relatively easy, assuming you can get your paint, your canvas, or your rock, and your chisel, or your torch, and your, your tape recorder, and your synthesizer, and you know, those things you can work with. There's a kind of premise for UCSC that it's a place where individual studies and individual creative work is encouraged. And in this environment, you're allowed the freedom, the privilege to take responsibility for what you're going to teach yourself. A momentum had started, and I didn't have to work so hard because the students who we were working with, understood, had learned what has to be done to, to do experimental ventures. It was not me leading them following. There was no sense of leading and following. Everybody was leading. Everybody was doing State of the charge, New Year's season. There's always a few people who are really committed to being themselves and to doing what they feel is, is the right thing to do, whether it's in dance or, or art or music. They're not interested in tradition. They're not interested in what other people think. They're interested in, purely, in merely expressing themselves. They can survive here. A lot of schools won't accept that. The Aesthetic Studies program here is, is a good example of that. There's a lot of people who are involved in their own personal art form, which is impossible to classify. A combination of archaeology and comparative religion and early music. I mean, you know, where would that fit in any other institution? can be done here if the people are really motivated, if they're really sincere in their interests. That has attracted a lot of people here. Those people I love to collaborate with. People come here because of those uniquenesses. They come here because you read the catalog and it says individual studies, and that attracts people who are somewhat self-directed. Sort of a protected environment. At Santa Cruz, there's something beautiful to everything that everyone does. And it is. There's encouragement, there's not too much pressure, and it's a nice world. Imagine yourselves with a pair of wings. The sheer joy of it, not having to sit those tragedies out. Okay, Sasha. It's just not a serious attempt to do art on this campus. Now, can you it's say... It's hard enough to do art on the West Coast. Rabbit. It's impossible to do it in such a comfortable situation as like the University of California at Santa Cruz. Uh, I guess it's something about Santa Cruz. It's something about this university, where it is and what it is, and the freedom that you, that you can have here to do what you want, and the fact that you can experiment a lot. incredible variety of musical idioms happening on this campus right now. There's world music program and there's a chamber music program. 
There's an electronic music program, there's a jazz program. And there isn't that sort of fundamental core courses being offered or being taught, which gives a program its base. And so you have a lot of specialties, but not the real fundamentals of music being taught here. There's not a, a real critical approach to the arts. There's not a real sense of experimentation in the arts. There's, um, there's not a respect for failure uh, on this campus in the arts. Uh, I guess partly because so little of it goes on that everybody wants to applaud everything that does go on. Yet when you start to applaud everything that goes on, you're turning out a lot of mediocre work. And there's no real criticism. What we really do need, for example, is, and it's true, again, of all the arts, it's true, the theater board in particular rely on soft money and rely on temporary positions to, to continue programming. And I think one of the things we definitely need, aside from space and equipment and everything else, we need the assurance that, that we're going to survive. And that assurance has to be in the form of, of permanent positions. The basic music courses, musicianship, music theory, counterpoint, um, the program hasn't ever established um, a core series. I mean, Music 10 and Music 12 are the courses which are supposed to take care of the music theory and musicianship. But there's been such a turnover of people teaching those courses that there's no continuity established. And so what, and a lot of the positions that are being filled this year on temporary money are up in the air, and the faculties don't know, the faculty members don't know whether they'll be coming back next year or not. So they're in a very awkward position of putting a lot of energy out and establishing programs, and not knowing whether or not they're even gonna be here next year to implement those programs that they're putting all this energy into starting. Because the resources don't match the basic outline of the system sufficiently, everything's a controversy. And because everything's a controversy, you put it off until where the controversy doesn't happen. And in these circumstances, it's damn hard to implement an arts program. There's an upper level administrative decision that the experiment here at Santa Cruz has failed and that the time has come to go back to being a traditionally oriented school. And hence, the areas of the really innovative things were going on here are gradually going to have their support cut out from underneath them and the school will become more and more traditional. First, there'll be pre-enrollment, then they're going to start instituting grades, and pretty soon evaluations will be dropped from the college system. I mean, it's just a question of time. So the water tank is disappearing, and at the same time, many other significant changes are taking place along Lackawanna's thousand-mile right-of-way. What is developed in a, in a school which has the premise of being fundamentally non-competitive is something that all those territorial-type thinking anthropologists describe as kill, right? When there's too many living beings in a small space, there's nothing to do but kill. And so, um, in the midst of the premise of non-competitiveness, you know, no grades, all of that sort of thing, the only way you can survive is to get out there and kill. It's a hopeless way to expect an experiment mm -hmm. to survive. I spin, I fly, my hands and feet flailing between spokes. I am caught, I am abstract, I was, I might be, I may be, I am woman. I am woman in a wheel, I spin, I fly, my hands and feet flailing between spokes. I am caught, I am abstract, I was, I might be, I may be, I may be, I am, I still am woman.
who abandoned that, um, the exploration, when we realized that we had a performance to do and that it was our senior project, that it was a time for decision making. Can we try this again, please? Can we try again? In order to more efficiently use the educational resources of college education in the state of California, some efficiency has to be brought into the system. We have to put the specializations in, in different places mm -hmm. where they're most suitable. Uh, it's an efficiency expert's idea. Unfortunately, what's happening is that the conservatories and the more traditionally minded institutions are grinding out performers who are technically more advanced than the great virtuosos even of the 19th century, but who have lost the musical, who have lost the, the essence of creativity and are merely machines. justification of efficiency has just overwhelmed the whole basic premise of broad education, which is like diversity and access in any number of places. Of course it'll be efficient. There's no question. It's much more efficient in terms of money, but it's not more efficient in terms of human and cultural resources, right? It's like death. There are sounds that I hear that don't really exist. It's a sound which is all around you and inside of you and outside of you, but is totally discreet. It doesn't exist as a, as a separate sound. It's more of an enveloping sound. It's not a drone, but it's constant. It's not a pitch, but it has a body to it. It's a sound that I hear a lot, but I have no way of realizing because it doesn't exist. It's not something you can extract. It's sort of like light. were all optical and physical. I used to think that it was all rods and cones. Okay, but I don't think that anymore. Now I truly think that the ultimate documentary will be of the light within. This project was made possible by a grant from the University of California in Santa Cruz. I would like to thank Gordon Muma for his encouragement in sponsoring this project and Rob Schaefer for his technical assistance. Our paralyzed administration not able to get their act together.